And welcome once again to the Spouter Inn. I'm Chris. And I'm Suzanne. And we have a special bonus episode for you today. We are joined by Jess Henderson, who is a contract faculty member of the English and Drama Department at the University of Toronto, Mississauga. She teaches a wide array of texts from Middle English all the way through to the digital age, as well as a variety of skills from how to read literature critically to how to write effectively. Hello, Jess. Thank you for joining us. Hi. Thanks for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. We were excited to invite you on for this follow-up episode to our episode on Emma, because I know that just recently, just a few days before we recorded our episode, you had gathered a bunch of people together to do a kind of virtual book group through Zoom, as is all the rage these days, about Emma. And I'm super curious both how was that and also why Emma now? Were you reading it anyways? Were you teaching it? Or or, or is that just a book you really wanted to talk with people about? Yeah, so we did decide to start this book club because of everybody in quarantine needing to just do some fun reading on the side. And Alex Gillespie and I, who are, are running it together, sort of put together a list of some books that we thought we could start with that would be kind of soothing reads. And Alex is a big Jane Austen fan. And I sort of put Emma on the list because we had heard of another book club that was reading Emma and that just ended up being the one that we chose also because um, of the recent movie that came out. We thought it would mesh really well and uh, get some students in to the book club meeting. So it was just sort of a, a bunch of circumstances that came together. Had you read it before? So <laughs> I believe I read it back when I was in high school. I have a memory of doing that, but that was before I was very sort of discerning and critical reader. So this might as well have been my first reading of the novel. <laughs> um, but I'd seen a number of the film and television adaptations before I reread the novel. Including Clueless. Yes, including Clueless. <laughs> oh, that's great. Is Emma your favorite Jane Austen novel? Do you have a favorite? No, actually, I do have a favorite. Um, it's the same as yours was, Chris. Uh, Northanger Abbey is my favorite. Oh, excellent. Because she does such a good job of lambasting the 18th century novel, sort of generic traditions, I find it hilarious. It's totally the funniest of the Jane Austen novels. Yes, I agree. I mean, I do, I do have a soft spot for the 1995 uh, Colin Firth Pride and oh, Prejudice. Oh, who yeah. doesn't? Yeah, and and the novel as well. But I think Northanger Abbey, in terms of reading, is my favorite. Yeah. Oh, that's fantastic. So, how did students or how did the participants respond to Emma? Oh, we had a lovely talk. We went longer than we uh, expected to. Um, we ended up not getting any students for the first meeting, which is too bad. But it was uh, in the end of the sort of term. I think they were writing papers and things. So there were about I think six or eight of us, and we had a really rollicking discussion, full of ideas, full of opinions, um, hot takes. It was great. It was really enjoyable. It was an interesting combination. Like I was there too. And thank you for having me. It was really fun. And, but there were a couple of people who were like really specialists, like they had, you know, field specific knowledge and they kind of hung back for the most part. They did. Um, and that was really interesting when they would intervene. You could tell it was like, it was just like a different kind of engagement that was interesting to watch. Mm -hmm. It allowed for some, some questions to be asked that maybe wouldn't have been answered otherwise, I think. <sighs> and then we had some readers who, this was the first time reading it, and they're just, I think, geographers, and they were reading it for fun. So it was a really nice spread of people. What was one of the hottest of the hot takes <laughs> that got aired? Oh, I'm trying to think. Um, I don't know. I think I started it off with what I think is my hot take uh, <laughs> of, for, of the novel. I started the discussion off by saying that I, I have never understood the friendship between Harriet and Emma. I just, it doesn't ring true to me in any of the adaptations. And then when you read the novel, it makes more sense because it doesn't end nicely. And all of the adaptations try and end it nicely. And that just sticks in my craw, I think. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm pretty much on board with you. I, I, but like, what is friendship? And, and is mm -hmm. the relationship between the two of them really friendship? It's, as, I, as I said in the episode, they're, they're not equals. They're, they're not compatible in that sense. It's clearly Harriet is a project for Emma that will be more or less disposed of when done. I think friendship was a term that you guys had discussed in another one of your episodes in terms of... Means it something being, different, right? Yeah, more of a patronage kind of relationship. I think that's what's happening here with uh, with Harriet and Emma, but to me, it does seem a, very much uh, of a use thing. Emma is using Harriet 
to fill a space that was filled before by Mrs. Taylor, Mrs. Weston. Yeah, there's, there's that lovely phrase. I think we talked about it last time very briefly, where like it's like, like Harriet is sort of like just the very thing that her house needed or something. Exactly. Like that's some bizarre phrase like that. It's like, whoa. To collect. And so, you know, their remaining friends at the end of most of the adaptations, like we're going to see each other forever. It just doesn't make any sense to me because Harriet is not on the same level as Emma in terms of social rank, but also in terms of intellectual abilities. Uh, just there doesn't seem to be much of interest in Harriet after she's been paired up with somebody, um, for somebody like Emma, who, who does need a lot of intellectual stimulation. Though it's weird, right? Because her dad is also not all that sharp. We get True. told that a number of times. And she loves her father, right? Mm-hmm. That's pretty clear. So we might think that somebody who's very clever like Emma is wants to be with somebody else who's clever, but that's maybe not always true. That's true. Yeah. Emma's deep love for her dad seems to overbalance or outweigh that sort of mismatch in terms of their, their intellect, which makes us wonder whether her care for Harriet is genuine, right? If, if it doesn't last beyond the end of the novel, really. Hmm. Yeah. I'm also thinking about Miss Bates, for example, who is also not the brightest character. And they have a relationship which is more clearly a kind of patronage relationship. They do. But which I think Emma would describe as some kind of friendship. And and maybe that's what, you know, Harriet might eventually turn into. That's mm-hmm. true. Miss Bates is an interesting character and she's my other hot take, which I didn't bring up in our in our reading group. But I actually think she is probably the closest stand in for Austin herself in her social position. I think you're right about that. Isn't that uncanny? It is. And yes, she is extremely ridiculous and, you know, her behaviors throughout the novel are ridiculous, but I actually suspect that Austin is trying to hint that Miss Bates is a little bit more perceptive than we give her credit for. She's able uh, to read people better than Emma is for most of the novel. Yeah, because it's a performance, isn't it? All that like sort of super hyped up, you know, rambling conversation, right? Yes. Uh, And it can be used, it, it is used effectively, I think, in places to distract people from where they should be focusing. I think there's actually a really interesting moment where Ms. Bates distracts people from attention on Frank's blunder that he makes when he's talking about sort of a carriage, Mrs. Cole's carriage or Mr. Cole's carriage. I just find the quote here. So he says, by the by, said Frank Churchill to Mrs. Weston presently, what became of Mr. Perry's plan of setting up his carriage? And Mrs. Weston looked surprised and said, I did not know that he ever had such a plan. Nay, I had it from you. You wrote me word of it three months ago. And Frank realizes that even though he is a constant writing companion with Mrs. Weston, he is also a constant writing companion with Jane Fairfax, and nobody knows that. Uh, and so he must have read it in an, a letter from Jane Fairfax, not Miss Weston. So he's made a blunder there. Because all women's handwriting is the same as we've learned elsewhere. That's right. Oh, wow. Yes, they do awesome. talk about women's handwriting. Um, and so slightly later, just, I don't know, a few paragraphs uh, in the novel, um, Mrs. Bates crashes into the conversation with her stream of consciousness conversation. And she says something really interesting. She's talking about Mrs. Perry. I never mentioned it to a soul that I know of. At the same time, I will not positively answer for my having never dropped a hint because I know I do sometimes pop out a thing before I'm aware. I am a talker, you know. I am rather a talker. And now and then I have let a thing escape me, which I should not. I'm not like Jane. I wish I were. I will answer for it. She never betrayed the least thing in the world. Hmm. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Just the sort of juxtaposition there of her talking about the fact that she's never let slip anything or never betrayed anything right after we watch Frank let slip something and betray something. I think she's actually picked up on that fact. And because she and Jane live together, I think she probably knows a little bit more about what's going on than everybody else. But she doesn't say peep about it for the entire novel. Well, because she has to protect Jane, right? Exactly. Mm. So, oh, that's fascinating. That's interesting. That's that's not at all how I read that scene, but I, I totally see that reading now. Mm-hmm. I, I very much took that as as Miss Bates being very confident in her description of Jane. And of course, of course, Jane couldn't like Jane overheard me mention it, perhaps, but she would never have told anyone. She hardly talks at all, which is such an interesting thing because, of course, Jane is only hardly talking at all right now. Mm-hmm. That's right. This doesn't seem like it's a thing that was true of Jane in the past and it won't be true of Jane in the future once her heavy secret has been revealed. So it seemed like Miss Bates had misread Jane, and that was a clue for the reader to pick up on who actually sent that letter. Mm-hmm. And, and and to make Miss Bates look 
dumb for not recognizing it. But perhaps it is actually she's covering for it for this whole situation. She might be. And I, I mean, it might be a generous interpretation of her, but I'd like to think that there's a little bit more nuance to her character than just sort of the the extreme ridiculousness that's usually portrayed by actors of her character and just sort of as people interpret her in this novel. Because I think she does, again, going back to this idea that she occupies the same sort of social position as Jane Austen herself. Um, Jane Austen probably this is a biographical reading, but probably sat in on a, or had a bunch of knowledge that she might have that other people didn't have. So, you know, sitting there sort of being the holder of knowledge. Well, I mean, that's the thing, right? When you're in the position of somebody who's of the same social class as everybody around you, but you're economically um, in a fragile position where you're in rented rooms, which is something that she and her sister and her mother were uh, for periods of time, you, you, how can I put it? You learn to use the tools you have at your disposal. That's right. And speaking and keeping silent are two of the most powerful ones, right? Exactly. Yeah. Especially for somebody who's, whose life revolves around words, whether it's sort of writing novels or writing letters or reading them. Mm-hmm. So you're very interested as well in Jane Fairfax. Yeah. This is the interesting thing about this novel is that there aren't any flat characters in a way. They're all really well developed. And Jane, even though she seems very flat because she doesn't speak a lot. She has a lot of emotion. Yes. Uh, it's just, it's this undercurrent that's sort of sitting there that you can kind of feel going on. And you know, by the end of the novel, that there's been all of this activity gone on in the background, which Emma has been blithely unaware of, but which we kind of get glimpses of here and then. Hmm. Well, yeah, for example, there's that moment when just before the expedition to Box Hill, they're at Mr. Knightley's house and she leaves precipitously. Yes. And, and you could tell there's a lot going on there, but Emma just barely understands the surface. Yeah. That moment, I think it encapsulates how we're all feeling. I'm just trying to find the quote right now. Yeah. This, this idea of being sort of exhausted in your soul. Mm-hmm. And she appeals to Emma to saying, you, you've surely felt this way too. Yes. Yes. We all know at times what it is to be wearied in spirits. Mine, I confess, are exhausted. The great kindness you can show me will be to let me have my own way and only say that I am gone when it's necessary. This kind of wearied in spirits. Uh, fatigue rather than in body. I agree that when we do get glimpses of Jane fully formed like that, that she is a very compelling character. Like she's going through a lot. She has a lot of thoughts on it. She's being very careful and cautious in how she moves and, and interacts in the world to deal with all of this. And yet by having her be so quiet and so just off stage for most of the novel, it almost seems like a, a missed opportunity to have such a rich character do more, right? Do you see what I mean? Yeah, no, exactly. I would love to see like a fanfic of Jane and Frank's relationship, sort of all of that activity that's gone on in the background. That to me seems like it has a lot of narrative potential there that gets just not used, um, but it's been built up enough that you can see that like it's deep enough to provide the character backgrounds. It would have been interesting to see Jane utilized as a character as a, a stronger foil for Emma, I think. Yeah. Um, because they are of the same social class and Jane is more accomplished than Emma. And Emma talks about this repeatedly at different points that, you know, like really Jane should have been her friend. Yes. Right? This comes up a number of times that, that she was her more appropriate peer in some sense, like not just class wise, but in other ways as well. And there's no good reason that Emma doesn't like Jane. She just doesn't. Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh, and I think uh-huh. I think those feelings sort of change towards the end of the novel. But at the beginning, she's staunchly sort of against Jane just because she's had to hear of her this, this whole time, her whole life. Um, but you do kind of want them to be friends. Well, sort of. Like, you guys, I mean, I don't know if you both like Jane. I find Jane also a little irritating. Like, she's really good at everything. She's one of these people you're like, oh, can't you be not good at something? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and this gets on Emma's nerves, right? Because Emma is this person who like likes to draw and she's sort of good at it, but she never finishes any of the drawings. And she she's clever and likes to read and she makes these lists of books to read, but she like never actually reads. You know, so she's, I don't know that she's lazy or something, mm-hmm. um, and, but she's smart enough to see this fault in herself. And there's nothing more irritating than seeing somebody good at something that you know that you screw up at, right? I, I agree. I think that Jane in another novel would be one of those super irritating sort of 
good at everything kind of characters. Here, she's recuperated by the fact that she's suffering so extremely, and you can see that. There is that. Um, I think, you know, in another Austin novel, we have Lizzie Bennett, who's not that, she doesn't play the piano on purpose because she says she's not good. And then is it Mr. Bingley's sister who's who's sort of extravagantly good at the piano? No, oh, it's Mr. Darcy's sister, right? Mr. Darcy's sister, right. Mm-hmm. Um, that comparison there, the insufferable Mrs. Darcy versus Jane Fairfax, you know, and Emma and, and Lizzie. But I think here in terms of my sort of sympathies, they lie more towards Jane than they do towards Emma, even though she is able to recognize her faults. As we talk about her, you know, I'm really struck by the notion of what would this novel be like, or what would a novel be like that had Jane Fairfax at the center of it, Mm -hmm. you know, in the way that we have Emma at the center. Mm -hmm. In some ways, it would be much deeper and more intense, but in some ways, it would be a little bit flatter because it wouldn't have that same sort of self-reflective second guessing quality, I feel like. I don't know. What do you think? Yeah, it would. I think we as the readers would be put through less of a ride in terms of uh, the uh, less of an interpretive ride. Yeah. yeah. Um, but maybe more, uh, more of a plot. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because Emma, nothing happens to Emma really. No, it's a very interior novel, very interior spatially. Like it, everything happens mostly inside except for the strawberry party in Box Hill. Mm-hmm. Um, but also everything happens in people's heads too. So I think if it was a story about Jane and, and Frank, it would be lots of locations. There'd be the seaside, the yeah. boat incident, the, you know, Sturm und Drang of all the fighting. Yeah, Maybe a little bit more gothic in that regard. Yeah. Uh, yeah. We'd just get another Northanger Abbey. It'd yeah. be great. <laughs> and Emma would be this monstrous creature in the background that occasionally would appear and do weird things. And we're like, what's going on with her? <laughs> Trying to manipulate, pull the strings. Yes. <laughs> that would be an interesting novel. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. I, I I would be surprised if somebody either recently or you know 150 years ago didn't write that novel. I think there is some fanfic out there. I haven't I haven't read it. Oh, there's there's definitely fanfic. I'm sure of that. But even like novels that were written in the 19th century that are follow-ons yes. or after or, or or things like that. Austin inspired a lot of that, and I'm sure there is something out there for Emma. I just don't know about it. I would love to know that. Uh, <laughs> yes, requires further research. Yeah. And also, you know, I mean, again, this would be something you'd be interesting to explore in the fan fiction domain. You know, Emma is somebody we see, she doesn't change fundamentally. Like, I don't think she's a different kind of person at the end, but she does learn. I mean, that's one of the things that's striking about her. Is she does learn, you know, she's far from being perfect at any point, but she's the capacity for change. And that makes you wonder, you know, what, what does her future look like? What does it look like when she's no longer tethered to her home because of her father? You know, what, what doors become open, you know, what always remain shut, but what doors become open? Um, that's neat to think about. Well, I wonder, I mean, I know you talked about how limited um, her sort of prospects are, right? She hasn't gone anywhere um, and she isn't able to, um, and then she just gets married. And I wonder if in that regard, her future wouldn't change that much. She, she doesn't seem to want to travel that much, nor does Mr. Knightley. But this capacity for learning and for growth is something that's really interesting about her character. Well, they're set to ultimately make it to the seaside, right? Because they got to go for two weeks for a honeymoon, right? So at least Emma makes it to the beach at last. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But then they come back. Oh, yeah. But yeah, I think we see her, what we see through the course of the novel, it's it's, a bildungsroman in the sense that she's maturing. She's maturing from needing sort of a mother figure in in Miss Taylor, uh, Mrs. Weston, to becoming potentially a mother by the end of the novel through this sort of project of Harriet, which is kind of mothering or big sisterly in in many ways. So I think in the future, we would see her mature further towards, you know, different stages of life, but I don't know whether it would be much different. The way we hear about the future, right, the ways in which we imagine the future kind of in this novel is the um, sort of foreshadowing that comes when children are around. Yes. Like there's all this discussion of little Henry, you know, um, Emma's sister, Isabella, uh, her son, who's supposed to be the heir to Donwell, Mr. Knightley's home, because his younger brother is married to Emma's older sister. Mm-hmm. And so at one point, Emma is unhappy at the idea of, is it Jane Fairfax getting married to Mr. Knightley? Because that would mess up the um, opportunity for little Henry to become the heir or to be, remain the heir. Right. And then there's another scene with like one of these children where Emma and Mr. Knightley are talking and... um 
it's a really odd little scene. Mr. Knightley says, I have still the advantage of you by 16 years experience and by not being a pretty young woman and a spoiled child. Come, my dear Emma, let us be friends and say no more about it. Tell your aunt, little Emma, right? There's a child in her. Mm -hmm. Tell your aunt, little Emma, that she ought to set you a better example than to be renewing old grievances and that if she were not wrong before, she is now. That's true, she cried. Very true. Little Emma, grow up a better woman than your aunt. Be infinitely clever and not half so conceited. We could have a Emma part two. Well, this is the thing, right? It's it's an uh, so little Henry, little Emma, and then at the end, you know, um, Mrs. Weston's baby daughter comes up. Also, so so, like these children are like, I don't know, they're like pointers toward a future, and and I don't quite know what to make of them, but I find them so interesting. That's interesting because um, Emma's own parents and Frank's own parents, uh, their mothers passed away when they were really little, right? So maybe by the time the children come around, it's less about Emma's future and more about the future of the children because. You don't know how, how long your life is going to be. So once you've had your kid, the kid becomes the story, right? The focus, yeah. And that danger is very much like present yes. you know, at, the, at the edges. We hear a little bit about it in connection with Mrs. Weston when, you know, she has the baby um, toward the end of the book, a uh, little Anna Weston. And I remember the chapter that describes it opens by saying that, that it refers to Mrs. Weston's safety. Yes that she was safe. And at first you read that and you're like, you don't know what's being talked about. And you're like, oh yeah, like she didn't die in childbirth. That's Mm -hmm. good, right? Mm -hmm. Um, And we know about Emma's mom's not around. So we, you know, the usual reason for that, right? I think it's interesting in Austin's novels that they, they're all so positive and, you know, we think of them as sort of happy, comforting kinds of things, because from all sides are pressing in these realities of disease and death of the time, right? There are so many characters in this novel that just aren't there or don't have family members there because they've passed away because of health. And it's omnipresent with Mr. Woodhouse's concerns, even if they're a little bit ridiculous. Yeah. He, the, I mean, it's comic in a way, but it's also a real thing. Yes. And he doesn't want, he's, I mean, he's terrified of the idea about women getting married, like poor Mrs. Weston, you know, it, they're talking about her going away from their house and that being the terrible thing, but also she's married, right? That, that's, that can be a dangerous thing. And yeah. so when he doesn't want Emma to get married, you know, in a way it's comic and ridiculous but in a way it's like he's not completely wrong this may be wrong but i think that the number one killer of women at the time was childbirth mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. so yes that change in position in, in social position in um, sort of relationship position does bring with it this ominous sort of Danger. you know memento mori kind of thing yeah mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i think illness and and disease is interesting in this novel i think it goes along with interpreting and reading mr woodhouse you know he thinks a lot about bodily health but he's often wrong in terms of his diagnostics Um, and i think (laughs) emma is similar they're both failed diagnosticians that's a great way to put it there's one point where she compares her observational skills to that of mr knightley he talks about mr elton And he had frightened her a little bit about Mr. Elton, but when she considered that Mr. Knightley could not have observed him as she had done, neither with the interest nor with the skill of such an observer on such a question as herself, that he had spoken it hastily and in anger, she was able to believe that he had rather said what he wished resentfully to be true than what he knew anything about. And this is about Mr. Elton being interested or not interested in Harriet or interested in her. Correct. I mean, she's got it completely wrong. And it's because, of course, she is reading what she wants to see in all exactly. Mr. Elton's actions. And, and of course, not only is she doing that, but she's accusing Knightley of doing exactly what she's doing, yes. which is how bad a, a, an observer she is. I think she's a good observer. She's a bad interpreter, maybe, let's mm. say. She's willful. She's a willful yes. interpreter, willful right? She, she yeah. wants a particular outcome, and she's going to see the world bending to her will, whether it's doing that or not. That's a nice way they pulled it out in the clues adaptation, with her father being um, a litigator and Cher being very litigious herself. Um, Emma is a arguer. She's a litigator herself. So she willfully interprets her evidence to make arguments that she doesn't necessarily believe. So there's a moment here, she says, to her great amusement, she perceived that she was taking the other side of the question from her real opinion and making use of Mrs. Weston's arguments against herself. So she has these sparring sort of arguments with Mr. Knightley, where she just willfully decides to take a a stance or willfully misinterpret things. You could see her recognize 
sort of the truth of something and then just decide to go the opposite it's, way. It's like that. sparring. You know, that's one of, that's one of the things I find so interesting about her character, right? Mm-hmm. It's like about power. I don't know if that's too big a word for it, but, uh, you know, she has this capacity, right? She's intelligent. She's She's got a, a strong will. She's got all this potentiality and it's just cannot be realized, right? And in part, it's because of just the world she's living in. But in part, it's this fact that she's she's not disciplined, right? She's not challenged, right? She's not... She hasn't bumped up against things enough to sort of have something to work on. That's probably why she argues the most with Mr. Knightley in the novel. I think he's the only one who she bumps up against in any real way, sort of sets some limits on her and sort of challenges what she says. It's a very weird romantic fantasy, isn't it? Right? It is. Yeah. Is it? <laughs> well, I mean, it must be, right? I mean, that is the romantic fantasy of this novel, right? Now, now it's been a while since I've read it, but isn't that also the dynamic between Elizabeth Bennet and Mr. Darcy? It is and it isn't, right? I mean, in the sense that the, the, the man in both those relations is presented as stronger, more confident, somewhat older, though much more so in the case of Mr. Knightley, mm-hmm. right? So there's a lot, there's a number of differences as well. But in part, that's just like, that's just reflecting to some extent the culture, right? But it's also about, I don't know, you can only depict a powerful woman if you put her against a man who is much more so, right? Mm. In right. other words, they can't be they can't be on a level. I was going to say they can't be matched, but they can be. I mean, the matching is really important in these novels, but they can't be on a level. There has to be some disparity for her power to be okay. She needs to be challenged in some way or else it's just not, she's not using her powers to the fullest of their ability. Uh. I, I agree with all that, although I do also want to add that Mr. Knightley at least seems to accept that sometimes Emma has a point and uh-huh. that he's said things wrong. Or he, you know, he, for example, realizes that there is something worthwhile about Harriet, mm-hmm. uh, which who he completely dismissed for a long time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So, so yes, he's more powerful and more authoritative, and and he bends like that whole business about moving into the house with her and her father at the end. Yes, I mean that that's a remarkable thing, and it is described as a remarkable thing. It is remarkable. Mm-hmm. Exactly. But I I guess I'm just saying that he's not solely there to make sure that the strong female character, so to speak, isn't too strong. Mm -hmm. It's also that she does have some power with him or on him that he that he appreciates. The other quality he has, which I find absolutely fascinating, is at least in certain passages, he speaks in this really abrupt sort of broken off kind of way. And the only other character who does that is Miss Bates. It's true. And it's obviously a very different kind of character, but I'm like, what is that about? I mean, what does that tell you about a personality that they talk like that? In terms of Mr. Knightley, I wonder if it's that they're so close. He doesn't feel the need to be sort of socially mm, graceful. Articulate. Yeah. 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 Uh, he is a little bit more graceful when he's talking to other people, although he shuts down Mrs. Elton very patly. Yeah, uh, that's great. Yes. <laughs> she wants to be, she says, oh, uh, just, you know, give me carte blanche and I'll do all the inviting to the party yeah. at your house. And he's like, no. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's one of the greatest moments. <laughs> oh my God. I also think just from a writerly craft point of view, there are a lot of moments where you get that kind of abrupt, broken English. And it feels like Jane Austen is is coming up with excuses to write that way in a way that you don't normally get to, but is kind of fun and engaging and exciting to do. Mm-hmm. So Miss Bates's lines are are amazing. When Knightley gets into that mode, it's it's terrific. When Frank writes that long letter, oh my it is also bouncing all over the place in a way that you wouldn't normally <laughs> see in proper writing, and and it's just great. She's playing with style uh, in a number of different ways we could think of. Because I know that this novel, you know, it's very much from Emma's point of view in a number of ways, but there are a number of voices in this novel that we get, uh, including all of the ones we just talked about. So she is able to play with style in that way um, and give them each their distinct voice, which I think is so clever. Well, one of the example of that that I, I think is just so great is, so there's the letter from Frank at the end, and it's just, you know, Frank is being very frank, like it goes on forever, right? Um, and we get the letter, but then we get Mr. Knightley reading the letter and he, Emma's in the room with him, and he's kind of giving this running commentary on the letter. So it's almost like we get it twice, um, and, and I just find that so fascinating, like you said, in terms of like the style, because it's, I don't know, it's it's giving you the letter for you to read, and it's giving you an interpretation of the letter. And then they talk. So it's, it exists in like a number of different forms almost. Like the letter is alive in a way. Yeah, multiple perspectives instead yeah. of just one sort of view of things. We're presented, I think not, um, Austin does this throughout the novel, we're given a number of different perspectives, and then we can choose which one we want to sort of 
use. Mm-hmm. In terms of style, it brings me back to something that she writes about Mr. Knightley's opinion of Frank's letter writing skills. Mm-hmm. It's just this beautiful line of alliteration. And this is something Mr. Knightley actually says out loud. So he, he can be quite blunt, but here, listen to this. He can sit down and write a fine flourishing letter full of professions and falsehoods and persuade himself that he has hit upon the very best method in the world of preserving peace at home and preventing his fathers having any right to complain. Wow. <laughs> right? I think that's three something. different kinds of alliteration yeah. going on in, in that line. That's that's fascinating. So you're right when you say that when he speaks in that sort of choppy way, that's about intimacy. Yes. Because he could be extremely articulate. And it's, I mean, that's also Mr. Knightley showing off a bit. Like, you Ooh. think this letter is fancy. I can be fancy. <laughs> Rhetorically. <laughs> Rhetorically, poetically, et cetera. You think I have no soul. I can I can sling alliteration around. That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I'm, I grew fascinated by how letters function in this novel and in mm-hmm. this world. I mean, you mentioned that they are sort of alive and and the way that they stand in for meetings and even the way that they could be compared with the meetings that, that go on. People come and they visit for a quarter of an hour, half an hour sometimes. And then to follow it up, there'll be a letter, which clearly took hours to write because it can be quite long. And then sometimes, you know, uh, uh, I have a thing I wrote down here. Uh, it was a very useful note for it supplied them with fresh matter for thought and conversation yes. during the rest of their lonely evening. Yes. Like it becomes an event. You, you sent her a whole night around this letter. You show it off to everybody that you know, you care about and, and they get to appreciate it. And it just stands in for the person in a way that is not how we think of letters these days, I guess. I think the letters are the method of travel in this novel. So mm-hmm. for people like Miss Bates, who um, doesn't get to travel outside of Highbury, all of her letters coming in from Jane, I think it's weekly, um, is her way of experiencing the outside world. So these letters are quite detailed, right? In terms of what people say and what went on. Uh, And then you get to masticate over them, (laughs) regurgitate and chew them over until you sort of derived all of the content out of them and all of the meaning. Letters are, they're so interesting because they're also a a class signifier, I think, in this novel, Hmm. Um, because they, the receiver paid for them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so for Miss Bates, who is, you know, in a rented space, having to pay weekly for the letters coming in from Jane, mm-hmm. that would be sort of, aside from her one method of travel, would be her one big sort of extravagance, I think. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. You're right. I hadn't either. And that adds another layer of depth to when Mrs. Elton, the, you know, Johnny come lately, Mr. Elton's wife, who tries to assert her dominance over the town and, and, and yeah, at one point offers to stop Jane from going and picking up her own mail by having her servants do it for her. If that means that she would be paying for the postage and trying to show a a financial kindness or showing a financial superiority, that's another interesting layer because that's not brought into explicitly in the text. I mean, we see her trying to pull Jane into this kind of patronage uh, relationship, this kind of friendship. Um, and I think that might be another sort of facet of it. She's trying to yeah, provide that kind of financial support or that kind of patronage there. But it also, it's a, it's a question of privacy, right? It's why Jane shuts it down. Oh yeah. 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 yeah that's absolutely why we, you know, how, how the reader is, is encouraged to respond to it. Like mm-hmm. we know that Jane and Frank have been writing on the sly and and this threatens everything. Like, not only does it threaten her to not be able to have the one line of communication that she has with her fiancé, but it also means that she's got to figure out how to quickly tell him to stop writing her before the next letter gets picked up by someone else. Exactly. But shockingly, the only, as far as I can remember, the only moment in the novel where anybody's privacy really gets infringed upon uh, is Miss. Weston infringing on Mrs. Weston's privacy. Yeah, he opens her mail. Yeah, mm. and reads it, even though it's not addressed to him. And he can see that clearly. And I, um, he's he usually behaves so well, but in that Th- moment... Doesn't, doesn't he say that he knew it was from Frank, and that's why he opens... I mean, like, it doesn't make it okay, but yes. I think he says that, right? So... It's 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 maybe suggesting that sort of shared familial quality of the letters. Seeing my son's hand presumed to open it, though it was not directed to me. So yeah, that gets into sort of the discussion of the handwritings and yeah. how we tell people apart when they're writing rather than speaking. Um, but it's still, it's quite a, you know, even for a married couple, it's quite a sort of a trespass uh, in terms of boundaries. 
you know, we were talking a little bit earlier about the cost of, of postage of picking up the letters. It's extraordinary how discreet this novel is about money, you know, for constantly talking about class and describing the inequities that separate out people in the class system. Like there's, there's so much of that, but not a lot of discussion of sort of dollars and cents. Like as you compare to something like Pride and Prejudice, where it's like, oh, he has 3,000 a year. He has 5,000 a year. He has 10,000 a year. She's an heiress of this much. Like it's like cash dollar, you know? Yeah. It's, it was kind of shocking to me because after reading Pride and Prejudice, you sort of expect everybody to be placed in this sort of hierarchical system based on how much they make, right? This Mrs. Bennett kind of system of, oh, he makes 10000 a year. Yeah, we don't get any of that here. Money shows up in very oblique ways, right? Well, the one time it does come up is when it's associated with the future and then the actual Mrs. Mrs. Elton. Mrs. Elton, yes. Mm-hmm. When mm-hmm. we first hear about her, it's in connection with how much she makes, how, you know, how much she earns or whatever, how much she's worth. Yeah. And some of the people that she talks about back yes. home and tries to set Jane up to be a governess at their places. Uh, she will talk about how much they're worth, I believe. So it's very mercantile in this way, like, uh, or associated with sort of mercantile, sort of upper blue mobile people, uh, rather than sort of the landed gentry who don't need to think that much about it. Yeah. And I guess in connection with the marriage market. Right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And also I imagine it's like, I wonder if it's just, there are a smaller number of people and they know each other already. They don't need to go over those lines. They, they've sort of all figured out where their order is. This is a well-established group of people mm-hmm. with a long history. And it's, and it's the newcomer, Mrs. Elton, mm-hmm. who needs to resort to money as, as a, you know, a measure of exchange. Well, that's the system she knows, right? Yes. Yeah. Figure out her, her place. Uh, she needs to put herself in relation to everybody else. So sort of expecting money to be sort of brought up throughout this novel and then not having it there. The thing that I did notice that was coming up throughout the novel was every time you get introduced to a character or pretty regularly, their age is given. That's so fast. It happens at the beginning of the novel too, right? Yeah. Like in the first lines. Which is, that's not in Pride and Prejudice. So this no. seems to be sort of this system within this novel in particular, within this small community of people who already know each other, age has more bearing in how they rank each other or relate to each other or interact with one another rather than money. What do you make of that? I think that's so fascinating. I don't know. It goes back to sort of this discomfort we have between Miss Mr. Knightley and Emma and their ages, right? Yeah, 16 years, right? Yeah. Which is not completely pathological when she's 21 and he's 37, right? But when she's 13, it's a little weird, right? It is a little weird, <laughs> which makes me very... The end of Clueless makes me very uncomfortable because she is mm. 16 almost. Yeah, uh, barely. Yeah. Almost or barely. Yeah, no. And he's you know, in his twenties or whatever. Um, I did, I I made up a list here of everybody's ages and, you know, I think Mr. Uh, Knightley is actually closer in age to Mrs. Weston Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, than, mm -hmm. than Emma is. Miss Bates must be also in the same sort of range, Mm -hmm. age range, because she's in her, the middle of her life. What do we take that to mean? Mm -hmm. So the three characters who are the closest in age are Emma, Frank Churchill and Jane Fairfax. And uh, and then everybody else is sort of older or younger than them. Mm-hmm. I don't. I don't know what else to really make about the ages, unless it it seems to be that sort of the, the man always has to be older than the woman. Yeah, but I mean the Emma Mister Knightley relationship is the most extreme, right? Especially the fact that the like their siblings are married to one another, mm-hmm. right? But they're it's Emma's older sister and Mister Knightley's younger brother, right? So yeah. they're closer to like. A reasonable age span, right? Which is really unusual, actually, that the, uh, well, is that unusual that the younger brother would have gotten married before the elder brother? I think that's maybe more unusual if it's it's sisters, right? Yeah. Isabel is older with, than with Emma. sisters, because yeah. it was considered indecorous for the second sister to accept a proposal before the first sister had, right? But I think with men, it's not quite so much of an issue. Mm-hmm. But still, it is weird, right? Yeah. Um, and it, it's one of the ways it complicates that whole family drama, which I find really absorbing. So I had been thinking about what this novel would be called in terms of abstract concepts. Mm -hmm. Like Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice. Yes. Um, And Clueless managed to do that in one word. It starts with a C. Um, But two words that I saw sort of threaded throughout this novel that I thought might sum it up are care and conceit, if we wanted Mm -hmm. to pair it in in an alliterative pairing. Um, Care in terms of... Charity coming out of the the Latin caritas, um, but also in terms of to care for somebody and to love, um, and then conceit comes up a lot. Um, either to be out of conceit with somebody, to become indifferent to, um, but also 
in terms of the meaning of being proud or vain and in terms of like a, a deliberate conceit like frank enacts with his sort of uh, misdirection of his attentions onto Emma. Um, I thought that that sort of pairing of those two words might sum up this novel and the various characters in it. That's interesting. So Suzanne had mentioned that you'd had this idea after the book club. Uh, Suzanne, did you come up with any possible abstract title? I didn't. One of the things that comes to mind is, um, you know, we think about Sense and Sensibility or Pride and Prejudice. One tends to line them up with a pair of characters in those books. Yeah. So with Sense and Sensibility, you tend to do it with the two sisters. Um, With Pride and Prejudice, you tend to do it with um, Elizabeth Bennett and Mr. Darcy. Here, it's so much about one person, this book. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, there, like we were saying earlier, no, none of the major characters is flat. There's so much intricacy in the, in the characters. There's a lot there, but we're largely in this subjectivity of this person who, to whom not a lot of stuff happens, but has this very bizarrely rich inner life. Mm -hmm. And so I feel like if it was an abstraction, you know, if it was two of them, I don't know what would be a character I'd put on the same footing. Yeah, because yeah, you're right there with the uh, caring conceit. It's a pairing, whereas clueless, it's singular, right? And she is the clueless one because it's all about her. Like she's a universe unto herself, right? Well, in the movie, it's applied both to the Emma character and the Harriet character, right? That's it's applied true. to both Cher and Ty at different points. And if the question mm-hmm. is who is the one who's truly clueless, mm-hmm. I think the clueless movie actually pairs them up more closely. Um, towards the end, Cher realizes is that she's created a monster in Ty and uh, Ty reflects Cher's own monstrosity back at her. That's right. So she needs, she realizes she needs to change herself um, and she's going to give herself a makeover rather than anybody else. Um, and it's a little bit problematic because her makeover and Ty didn't go that well, <laughs> but I think she, she has to reevaluate her own assumptions and realize that it's not, it's not other people who need to change to become more like her. It's her who needs to be, to change to become a little bit more like other people. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, I was thinking about that that fun puzzle that you that you proposed, <laughs> and and I came up with something. Although I don't think it would have worked in the English of two hundred years ago. But um, the closest I could come up with was class and classiness. Oh, Ooh, I like that. I like it. So, who's classy in this novel? Well, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in a certain sense, that's that's what we are trying to navigate, right? Like Emma is presenting herself as as the policer, the arbiter of, of yes. what is appropriate for the class, what is classy in that sense. Knightley has a very different take on things, but was it Jane all along? Mm-hmm. Hmm. And the Coles are somebody interesting to think about that um, because they are actively hmm. collecting markers of their class and sort of embettering themselves. Yes, the new money family in the novel. And it does kind of work because Emma goes to the party, but, you know, just begrudging. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I like that title. I do too. Oh, well, excellent. Uh, This has been a really fun conversation. Yeah, Yeah. thank you. Thank you for joining us. It's been a delight. I love talking about books. We will have links for where anybody who might want to get in touch with Jess can get in touch with her on our show notes. But if you'd like to get in touch with us, you can always email us at spouter at megaphonic.fm or we're on Twitter at The Spouter. We would always love to hear from you. Show notes with links for things that we've mentioned in today's episode will be at megaphonic.fm slash spouter slash 28B. And the Spouter Inn is one of the fancy little podcasts over at Megaphonic FM. So until next time. Until next time. See you again at the Spouter Inn.